message I have in my heart this morning is very heavy on my heart. It's, I believe it is what the Father wants, what Jesus wants proclaimed at the end of this time where we've just been talking about the Father. There is so much we could say. You know, if you just look in this booklet, there's so much we can say. We could go on for months on any one of the Godhead, any one of the Trinity, and the Father is no exception. And we've tried to How can I word this so it comes out right? The Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they're all the same, but the Father is awesome. He is beyond description, beyond comprehension. His love is unfathomable. His desires to, to father us and see us succeed and and work in our hearts is beyond anything we've ever experienced or could, will ever experience on this earth. He, he is just much greater. And he wants nothing but good for us. Nothing but the best for all people on earth. And we've tried to present that side in, in the short little period of time we've had on talking about the Father as we're working toward the Holy Spirit. We've tried to present that side, and that is an absolute definite one side of the coin, but there is another side to the coin. That if you're going to talk about the Father, has to be talked about. So let me start by saying this. We had reoccurring questions come in out of last Sunday that we're going to look at in conjunction with what I was sensing this last message about the Father should be about. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, with today, these five are going to be separated out, and you can find them under the title of Eternal Security, as well as they will also be in the series we're in, which is the operation of the Holy Spirit. But today I want to, well, I don't necessarily want to. Like I said, it's kind of heavy on me. Um, I need to address a deception that has gotten on the American Christians. I don't know if this is worldwide. It could be. I don't have enough information about worldwide. It's gotten on the American Christian, and in an effort to placate the American Christian, it's slipped into the church. And it's an, a deception that we need to talk about. It, it has seemingly been gaining momentum. So we're going to square off with it and face it this morning. We want revival. Absolutely, that, that whole theme of that. We want that goes with dying to ourselves and being part of what God's trying to do. We want revival primarily the reason should be is for the salvation of the human being. That should be the primary reason we want revival is so that everyone who wants to gets confronted with the salvation message and the power of God that they get saved. Because the alternative of not doing that and entering into eternity is to fall into the hands of a wrath-filled, angry Father God. You can just feel it. Like, oh, that's not our God, is it? Yes, it is. He is going to put an end to sin. The demonic realm having sway, he is going to end that whole business, and he's angry about it. He will bring it to an end. And it's a side of the character of the Father God the church doesn't like to talk about. We like to talk about the good side of God, and he is really, really beyond anything we could ever describe. But there is another side to God that has to be presented if you're going to present a balanced view of the Father. So in an effort to answer the questions and talk about this, 
we're going to jump in in Hebrews 10 because this is where primarily the questions came out of. And we're going to read through the whole chapter. So rather than using PowerPoint, she's just going to follow me with scriptures this morning. I've got a lot of them. I'll go as quickly as I can. Um, but I really want to make this plain. And the, the main reoccurring theme of the questions that came in were this. If there's no sacrifice left for willful sin, I've sinned willfully, am I saved? Can I be saved? Can I still, can I still be saved after I've willfully sinned? Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So let's start with verse 1. <clears throat> we'll do the first number of verses in New King James, and I'm going to do the whole thing because I want you to see the context of what's being talked about here. Usually I say, and this is what's talked about in the first half of the chapter, and we'll just jump to the second half, but this is important. I think we need to see the context here so we get it. For the law, that's the Old Testament law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. So the, the law was a picture and a type. It wasn't the real deal. The law can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. So the law couldn't forgive our sins. The sacrifices couldn't forgive our sins. In fact, the law was given, according to Paul in Romans 3, the end of the chapter, the law was given to point out we're sinners. To get everybody guilty and on the same page of, I am a sinner. I need a savior. That was the purpose of the law. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? That's a question. In other words, if the sacrifices that were being given in the Old Testament would have worked, wouldn't have they quit giving the sacrifices? For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. So it would have done its job, cleaned us up, we'd have been great. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Because the sins weren't taken away, it's just a reminder of, yeah, we're sinners and we need help. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Okay, so here's the, the, the starting thoughts of, chapter, of this chapter in, in Hebrews. We're talking about sin. We're talking about the sacrifice needed to pay for or get rid of the sin. The Old Testament sacrifices weren't sufficient to do that, and that's why they had to be offered over and over and over, and every year sin, uh, the atonement was made for the whole congregation, and in between people were, were sacrificing on an ongoing continual basis. The whole thing with sacrifices was this. It was not to put people in a position where, hey, this is going to cost you, which it did. <laughs> I mean, they were always sacrificing their best. You couldn't bring... Well, we got a calf that looks like it's dying anyway, and we got to go make a sacrifice, so let's take that one. You couldn't do that. Nope. You got to bring your best. So it did cost the people. But it wasn't the thought of, I'm going to make you pay for what you did. What God needed was the blood. He needed the sacrifice of the blood of the animal, which looked forward to Jesus' blood. It was a picture of Jesus' blood. Because the life is in the blood. And if you're going to exchange a life for a life, it has to be done with blood. Amen. That's how that works. You can't have your sins forgiven without somebody paying for that. And it has to be paid for with blood. Because God deposited that life into the blood. So, verse 5. Therefore... When he came into the world, and I'm just going to point something out to you as we go through this chapter, how the Trinity shows up, and many times we just skip it, but I want you to see it. When he came into the world, he said, who is he? Jesus, okay? When he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering, you did not desire, who is you? The Father, we're going to see that in a bit. But a body you have prepared for me. So there you've got the Father and the Son in that verse. Jesus' physical body, in, you know, it, was, it was to show us God. He came to show us God. But if you want to reduce it down to one thing, Jesus came into earth in a physical body so he could be the blood sacrifice needed, the exchange needed to redeem us, pay for us. In a, in a nutshell, that was it. Verse 6. 
In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. The Old Testament stuff, God was, it, you know, it was done as a picture. It, it, it covered their sins until Jesus came when they could be forgiven. But God really didn't take pleasure in it. Then I said, who is I? Jesus. Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Who is God? That's the Father. Anytime in the New Testament you see the word God or Father, it's, it's Theos or the Father God. Always New Testament. Old Testament, it's different because you got all kinds of names that show up that they translated God. In the New Testament, it's just Theos. It means Father God. So Jesus is saying we had all these sacrifices going on, all this blood being shed because we have a sin issue that has to be dealt with. They weren't cutting it. So, Father, you set it up so I would come in a physical body and be the ultimate sacrifice. Okay? Going on. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. So he didn't want them, and he didn't like them. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The father didn't want that to happen. He didn't like what was happening. It was just had to be done to get to where we're going. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Of course, the I there is Jesus. I have come to do your will, O Father. He takes away, he, the father, takes away the first covenant. That's talking about covenant. That he may establish the second covenant. Please keep that thought in mind, because I'm going to make a, it, it shows up a couple of times. We don't have two covenants now, the old covenant and the new covenant. We live under the new covenant. The old was removed. Okay? That's going to be important. Verse 10, by that, will, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once and for all. So Jesus doesn't have to keep dying like the Old Testament sacrifices over and over and over. He was the perfect sacrifice. He only needed to die once. Verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away the sins. So that's how they did it in the Old Testament. But this man, which is Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifices for sin or sins forever sat down at the right hand of the Father. From that time, he's waiting till his enemies, Jesus' enemies, are made his footstool or put under his feet. For by one offering, he, Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. This goes back to last Sunday's message. If you, if you see the concept of we can lose this thing, it shows up all over. The offering of perfecting forever is for those who are ongoingly being sanctified. It's like we said at the end of the message last Sunday. Just keep growing. Just keep, just keep growing in God. Keep moving forward. Keep being sanctified. You're fine. But if you're not continually being sanctified... Well, at some point, the offering of what Jesus did may not apply to you anymore. Verse 15, but the Holy Spirit. Oh, now the Holy Spirit's getting involved. We had the Father and the Son to this point. Now the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. So he's going to testify to the same thing. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. So now, the way it's written there, I can't tell if the Holy Spirit said the same thing the Lord did, the Lord being Jesus. So were they kind of in agreement to where when this was spoken the first time, which is in the Old Testament time, so Jesus wasn't on earth yet, so this was spoken in heaven. This is the covenant I'll make with them in those days, Jesus said. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And the Holy Spirit said, yep, I witness with that, and I say the same thing. This is the covenant that's going to be made in those days, and the laws, it seems like the two were, were in agreement saying the same thing. 
just interesting how the Holy Spirit plays in with this. Verse 17, then he adds, speaking of Jesus, their sins and their lawless deeds, then he adds. So the Holy Spirit was in agreement with that statement. It seemed to repeat the same statement. And then Jesus added, their sins and lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sacrifice. So now that concept, verse 18, is going to show up again. It shows up twice in this chapter. In this setting, what he's saying is, once your sins are forgiven or remitted, there's no longer a need for sacrifice. You're clean. You're good. No more sacrifice for sins remains. So Jesus did it once. He doesn't have to do it again and again and again for us. All we have to do is just receive what he did. Okay? Now we're going to jump to the amplified version and read the rest of the chapter. And we'll start at verse 18, the verse we just read in the amplified. Now where there is absolute remission, forgiveness, and cancellation of the penalty. That's what remission means. So once you've received forgiveness and the penalty has been dealt with of these sins and law breaking, there is no longer any offering made to atone for sin. You've received it, it's done. Okay, moving on. Verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter the Holy of Holies by the power and virtue in the blood of Jesus. Okay, so we'll stop right there and review. He's talking about the blood in the Old Testament because of sin and the sacrifices because of sin and how we're going to deal with sin up until Jesus time and how those Old Testament sacrifices for sin didn't cut it when Jesus came he was the perfect sacrifice he only had to offer the life in his blood one time make that payment make that exchange and now the human race is good if we'll receive what he did for us and we can have absolute remission, because that's what he bought. Verse 19, therefore, brethren, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies by the power and virtue in the blood of Jesus, by this fresh, new, and living way, which he initiated, dedicated, and opened for us through the separating curtain, <clears throat> the veil of the Holy of Holies, that is through his flesh. Now, I'm just going to point this out. In the, for those of you that are understanding, uh, have the picture of the tabernacle or the temple had the same thing. From There was two parts to the building. The outer part is where the priest went in and ministered, and that all stands for different things. Then there was a huge seven-inch thick veil that was made out of animal hair, extremely strong, that separated this side from the side where the Ark of the Covenant was, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwelt. That veil that kept people out from getting into the close presence of God was the flesh. That was the type of that veil. Our flesh is what keeps us from getting in tight with God. Now, that veil was, was split when Jesus died, which means the flesh no longer can separate us from God. We can go right in by the sacrifice that Jesus gave. But I just thought it was interesting how he points it out here is the veil is the flesh. Now, everything to this point in the chapter deals with sin, the Old Testament law, and introduces Jesus because the Old Testament sacrifices and law and everything were insufficient for securing our salvation getting us forgiven. Now he's going to start switching over to the new covenant and start talking about it more, having created the picture of this is why we're going to talk about what Jesus did, and this is what was happening, and it wasn't good enough, and the Father didn't like it, took no pleasure in it, didn't even want it, but it had to be done to prepare for Jesus. So in your studies, in your... In your getting answers and reading the Bible and so forth, you cannot interpret the New Testament by the old. 
There's lots of good information in the old, but we're not in it anymore. Now, we can learn lots of things, but how it functioned and operated is totally different from how we function and operate. That's why, and I'm just going to make some statements here to you. I don't have this. This would have been a nice one to have on PowerPoint, but I don't. So I'm just going to make the statements. So you can at least hear it. According to Ephesians 3.15, that covenant, the Old Testament covenant, was annulled. When something's annulled, that means it's ended. It no longer exists. It was set aside because it was weak and useless, Hebrews 7.17. God found fault with it, Hebrews 8, 7, and 8. And because he found fault with it and it was weak and useless, he declared it obsolete, Hebrews 8.13. Once something's obsolete, it's outdated, it's over, it's worthless. Let her go. It's a nice antique, you know. But your phone hanging on the wall with the cord attached to it is obsolete. If you're still using it, you need to update. Well, I like it. Well, I know, but it's kind of weak and useless at this point. I mean, it's, it's things have changed. The old covenant was set aside to make room for the new, Hebrews 10, 9, and was abolished, Ephesians 3, 15. So it was annulled and abolished. You cannot say the things of the Old Testament still, that the laws and the, the, the how things ran and the rules and how God operated with the human race and all this stuff applies today. It does not. Now, we can learn some awesome things out of the Old Testament. But all the rules and laws, and in Colossians, Paul kicked out the Ten Commandments. And I know that's a shock because we like to hang them on the wall. Why do we hang them there? We can't do them. Is it a reminder of how much we lack? Is that why we like them? Well, I want to be able to point out to my kids and say, thou shalt not lie. They're going to lie. So now what are you going to give them for a solution? Well, you don't measure up because you lie. See, that's not the solution of the new covenant. So Paul threw them, them out. You say, you don't believe in the Ten Commandments? Oh, I know they were real, and I know God wrote them, and I know they held a lot of sway in the Old Testament. But there's two commandments in the New Testament that take care of all of them. All they were designed for is to condemn us. That's what Paul said in Hebrew, uh, Romans 3. To be our schoolmaster, to shut us up and say you're guilty. So is that why we want to show them to our children? Thou shalt not lie, so shut up, you're guilty. Well, if you leave them there, that don't help them. Jesus came to take them someplace. So we got to switch over to that new covenant. Colossians 2.14, the Old Testament was canceled. So it was made obsolete, annulled, Hebrews 3.15, and canceled in Colossians 2.14. So the thought of, well, the Old Testament covenant still stands. No, it was canceled. It's over. It's done. Moving on. So now he's going to switch to what the Christians should be. Since we're forgiven, since the sacrifice came, since Jesus did these great things and the Father did these great things, here's where we should be focusing on make these our goals. Verse 21, and since we have such a great and wonderful and noble priest, that's Jesus, who rules over the house of the Father, that's God, the Father, let us all come forward. So since this wonderful thing has taken place, let us all come forward and draw near with true, honest, and sincere hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by our faith. So in other words, let's be real. That, that whole first part, I paraphrase. 
Let's be real with our life with God. In parentheses, by that leaning of the entire human personality on the Father, in absolute trust and confidence in his power and his wisdom and his goodness. So what's he saying? Since Jesus made it available, the veil is rent, the flesh can't stop us anymore, our sins have been paid for, we have access to the Father. Get real with how you're living and lean your entire being on him. And trust and, and have confidence in his power and his wisdom and his goodness. He's talking about the Father there. So that's one thing. And then he says, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty, evil conscience. Now that goes back to an Old Testament picture where they sprinkled the utensils and cleansed them and so forth. The picture is the things in our conscience that bother us can be washed away in this new covenant. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. And I don't care because if you've asked forgiveness, God's forgiven you. You need to get your conscience washed clean so you quit thinking about it. Is that possible? Absolutely. And our bodies cleansed with pure water. Again, the picture of cleaning back there or sanctification. In other words, even our bodies and the desires our bodies have can be cleaned up. He's an awesome father we serve. Verse 23. So since that's all possible, let's get real. Let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish. Well, what's the hope? Previous verse. I mean, all this awesome stuff is available. Just jump into it. Seize it, hold fast, retain it, hang on to it. Don't waver. And confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised, that's the Father, is reliable, he's sure, and he's faithful to his word. So that's how Christians are supposed to live in the New Testament. Not just always looking at their sin and the sacrifice and I'm never going to be good enough and I broke another commandment, so woe is me, blah, blah, blah. Whole different attitude over here, isn't there? Okay? Moving on. Let us consider and give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another, studying how we may stir up, stimulate, and incite to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. So, in the new covenant, we're not looking for disqualification like some churches do. It's, let's find a way to disqualify them. I don't like them being in teaching the children. No, we're actually supposed to give attention and study how we can stir people up in love and in deeds and in noble activities. Help them get moving. Part of that is verse 25, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. So that verse is exactly what we're doing this morning. We're assembled together, and there's going to be some warning, encouraging, admonishing, urging of each other, and all the more as we know we're going into the end times. So let me just throw in a statement here. It's not part of the message, but let me just quickly throw it in. There can be a deception, well, not can be, there is a deception that can slip in, let me say it that way, with the online church attender. Now, we put our services online, and I think it's an awesome tool because I'm not saying you have to be here 52 Sundays a year. There are times you have to leave, you have to go do things. You've got access online. I'm talking about the person who doesn't go to a physical church. Their church is online. That's the only place they go to church is online. There can be a deception with that.
that verse tells us we're not supposed to do that. Well, I'm assembling together with them online. Okay. So are you tithing to the church online you're assembling with? When you get sick, are you calling the people in Atlanta or California to come and visit you in the hospital? When your granddaughter's getting married, online church going to do the ceremony? When someone dies and needs burying, well, go to your online church. When you're trying to raise your children and show them an example of how to live for God and instill some things into them and, and get them to understand, hey, this is a church, this is a body, this is, this is us as a group moving forward to do things for God. You're doing that while they're playing in the background, looking at their iPad, their phone, and you're sitting and watching your online service? There's a deception that can creep in with it. That is not God. Because we are urged to do that. So we've read some things. There's what a Christian's life is supposed to be. However, God knows people can play games with this. And after everything that Jesus did and the Father did and after the, the plan he has laid out for every one of us and he wants us to succeed and prosper and never fail and, and all the good things he has offered to us, there's still people who will play games with this. So let's go to the next verse. This makes sense now because this is the verse that brought the questions. For if we go on deliberately and willingly sinning, after once acquiring the knowledge of the truth. So you know better. It's not that you don't know. You know. There is no longer any sacrifice left to atone for our sins. No further offering to which to look forward to is how the Amplified says it. There's a second time that's brought up. He's touching that phrase from a different side now. The first side was once you're forgiven, you don't need any further sacrifice. You're forgiven. Once this one is when you know better and you're willfully just doing your own thing, there's no sacrifice that remains for you. That's the verse the questions revolved around. Now remember the context that verse falls into. You had the Old Testament. We knew we had a sin problem. We were sacrificing animals. It wasn't working. But we were looking forward to Jesus. Jesus had a body prepared so he could come and be the supreme sacrifice removing the veil between us and the Father, reuniting us, letting us have the ability to get back into step with the Father, fulfill his plan, live in the awesome things he has for us. That's what we got up to this point. But if we deliberately, willfully just ignore that, hmm, Well, can we be forgiven if we willing, willingly and deliberately sin? That was one of the questions. Am I forgiven or have I gone too far and maybe I think I'm saved and I'm not? Because remember, I just did something that I probably thought I shouldn't, but I did anyway. Okay, so now remember this principle to answer the questions. Here's the principle. Salvation is a matter of the heart, not what we do. You can't get saved by what you do, and you can't lose your salvation by what you do. And I'm going to have to explain that a bit, but I'm, I will. Give me a second. It's a matter of the heart. If God's over there and we're walking our life and are doing our own thing, repentance means a change of mind and heart where you turn away from the direction you are going and you go towards what God wants. That's how we get saved. Something inside of us, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, tells us you need to go that way. And you just know, and you know you're a sinner, and you know you need to be saved, and you ask forgiveness, and you turn, and you move back towards God. How do we get unsaved? A turning in the heart that goes, 
what God wants is not the most important to me right now. It's what I want that's most important, and I'm really considering doing what I want, and I know God doesn't want me to do it, or I know God wants me to do this, and I'm really considering not doing it because I don't want to do it. And we begin changing in our heart. We're deliberately and willingly choosing a change here. And if we keep playing with that game, at some point we're going to turn and walk away from what the Father wants, and our heart has turned away from God. That's what that verse is talking about. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. So that's how we get saved, through faith. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't get saved by our works, okay? So then why do Christians think they can stay saved by their works? This is in, we have a grace series that the Lord slapped me with back in, boy, this is in the modular. And he asked me that very question. He said, you tell people they can't get saved by what they do, but then you tell them they can lose their salvation by what they do. So in other words, this is what he said to me. In other words, once someone's saved, if they do everything right, now I owe them salvation? Well, see, I don't, I, I've never committed adultery, and I don't lie, and I try to do all this stuff right. You owe me salvation. No, he owes us nothing. Salvation is a gift, not of works, lest it get into the church and people start bragging about how awesome a Christians they are because they're not like those people. Right? You say, well, if someone goes out and sins, they haven't lost their salvation? No. Nah. You went out and sinned, and the Holy Spirit was all over you like white on rice. And you weren't happy, and you weren't content, and you knew what you did was wrong, and you needed to change it, but you didn't know if you wanted to change it, and there was this war going on. That war is an indication you're still saved. He's working on you. You say, well, when do you lose it? When it doesn't bother you at all inside. You have so totally turned away from God that whatever you're doing doesn't bother you at all. It's not the things you're doing that's going to take you to hell. It's the turning your heart away from God. This is just the fruit of turning away from God. The same way as if you turn toward God, there's fruit that goes with that person. They start living different. It's a heart matter. So to answer that question, if you're going to deliberately and willfully just turn away from God and sin, yeah, that's dangerous ground. Okay, verse 27, well, what's going to happen then? There is nothing left for us then but a kind of awful and fearful prospect and expectation of divine judgment and the fury of burning wrath and indignation will, which will consume those who put themselves in opposition to the Father. There's the heart, the other side of the coin of the heart of the Father. Well, if you're going to turn away and just go do your own thing and you die in that position, there's nothing for you. Well, but I was saved. The sacrifice doesn't apply anymore. There's nothing for you but an awful, fearful prospect and expectation of divine judgment and the fury of burning wrath. Whose fury of burning wrath? And indignation, which will consume. Well, whose indignation? It's all the fathers. 
Verse 28, any person who has violated and thus rejected and set at naught the law of Moses, that Old Testament thing, which was at the beginning of the chapter, which we talked about, anybody who messed with that, as worthless as it was, is put to death without pity or mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And I say worthless as it was because, not because it didn't have a purpose, not because it didn't have a point. It just couldn't, it couldn't do what needed to be done. Jesus had to come and do that. So in that regard, it just was pointing out that we're sinners. But even in that covenant, if you messed with it willfully, just why well, don't really care. If two or three people said, yeah, we witnessed the fact that's their heart, that's what they said, they killed them. And that's that old thing. Verse 29, how much worse, sterner and heavier punishment do you suppose he will be judged to deserve who has spurned and thus trampled underfoot Jesus, the Son of God? You say, well, how did he trample him underfoot? It all revolves around this one word, and it shows up all through the New Testament, Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Once we turn away from him being the master, the owner, the Lord, the ruler, and we become our own Lord, we're going to master our own lives. I'm not serving him. I'm going to do what I want to do. Now we have spurned him, the son of God. That's one point. Next point. And who has considered the covenant blood by which he was consecrated common and unhallowed. In other words, it ain't that big a deal what Jesus did. No, it's everything what Jesus did. Well, how would they be? Just because they're doing their own thing their own way doesn't mean they don't think it was a big deal. Sure it does. Because if you actually thought what Jesus bought for you was a big deal, you'd be back over there serving him. But what you want is a bigger deal than what he did for you. Thus profaning it, the blood, and insulting and outraging So the Holy Spirit gets raging over this, the Holy Spirit, because he's the one who imparts grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of God. So you're going this way, you're going towards God, and he's just imparting it, and he's working with you, and he's growing you, and he's bringing you closer to the Father, and then you decide to willingly just kind of turn, and I ain't going to do that anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. And this, It outrages him. I didn't know the Holy Spirit could rage. Well, now you do. Verse 30, for we know him who said, and we'll read the middle of the verse says that's Jesus. For we know him, Jesus, who said, vengeance is mine, retribution and meeting out of full justice rests with me. He is our judge. The Father gave that to him. I will repay, I will exact the compensation, says the Lord. So we know that's Jesus. And again, the Lord, Jesus, will judge and determine and solve and settle the cause and the cases of his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful, formidable, and terrible thing to incur the divine penalties and be cast into the hands of the living Father. Well, you needed the whole chapter to understand why. Because of everything that was explained that got us here, and then we just cop an attitude and walk away. It's a terrible thing to face the Father when we've rejected all of that. You say, why? Because the Father is filled with wrath over sin and what it's done to his creation, what it's done to heaven. Remember, sin started in heaven. There's a reason he's going to come up with the new heavens and earth. He is livid over this sin thing, and the most loving thing he can do is end it. Can you imagine the sin thing going on for eternity and humans having to live in this for eternity? 
What a mess. The most loving thing he can do is he said, I'm going to let it play out, and then I am ending it because I am so angry this started. Anger means I want something to stop. Well, he wants this whole sin thing to stop. You say, are you trying to make people afraid of God? Absolutely. <laughs> can you go to Philippians 2 with me quickly? This is one I didn't have on your list. Philippians 2. Absolutely. See, this is part of the deception that slipped into the church. See, now, I have a wonderful relationship with my father. I speak with him. He doesn't talk much because that's not his office. But occasionally he'll talk with me. Everything that the father says is always encouraging and, and upbuilding and plans for the future. And this is where we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. It's the Holy Spirit's job to talk to me about my sin. The father doesn't talk to me about that. It's just I feel close to my father. I am looking forward to going to heaven to be with my father. I love my father. However, there is something in the back that continually plays that says, man, I got to get this right. Not that I can live good enough. I mean, this whole thing of applying the blood and being sincere and leaning, like he said, leaning wholly on God and trusting him and holding on and adhering to him. I got to get this right because my father, whom I love so dearly and loves me so dearly, has the last say. I don't. And that scares me. And it should. One of the things that's missing in this world is the fear of God. That's why we go down the stupid roads we go down. Notice this verse, uh, Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved, this is New King James Version, as you have always obeyed, so he's talking about obedience here, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Huh. Fear and trembling. Do you know what? the definition for that word fear there is? Oh, it's on respect of God. No, it's actually not. It's actually to be put in fear, alarm or fright, be afraid, exceedingly fearful, terrorized. You say, why would God say we're supposed to work our, our salvation and obey with that attitude? Because it is a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to go to judgment and fall into the hands of the living God the wrong way. That is going to be just a nightmare that will go on for eternity. The definitions, that's the same word used Basically, throughout the whole New Testament concerning fear, I'll give you some examples. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 14, 26, the disciples were troubled. They were afraid because they saw a spirit, or they thought they saw a spirit. Verse, chapter 28, verse 4, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake. So the, 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 uh, the supernatural appearance to the keepers of the, of the jail were shaking out of fear. Uh, chapter 28, verse 8, quickly from the sepulcher, they removed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great rejoicing. Uh, fear came all those who dwelt. I mean, just read it through the concordance. It's the same Greek word used for, I'm terrorized. Well, how can you be terrorized of someone you have a good relationship with? It's hard to explain. Do I have any doubt of my salvation? None. None whatsoever. The Holy Spirit confirms to me I'm totally saved. However, I am terrorized by the thought of turning away from him. And someday he looks at me and says, I have no clue who you are. Remember last Sunday's message? I have no clue who you are. That thought terrorizes me. So, Father, what do you need from me? We're not going there. We are not going there. 
there's only one thing I want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I do not want to hear. Depart from me, you evildoer and worker of iniquity. That whole thought of I could actually end up that way, that terrorizes me. Well, God wouldn't do that to someone he loves. No, do you know who's doing that? We're making those choices. He is just going to end sin. And if we just end up on the wrong side of that fence, he has no choice. So he goes on in Philippians 2. We won't take time to read it. We've got some other things to cover here. Jump back to Hebrews with me, if you would, please. Uh, we'll finish that chapter, and then I've got a few other verses to show you. Verse 32. So verse uh, 31 was, It's a fearful, terrible thing to incur the divine penalties and to be cast into the hands of the living God. Well, he just explained how this all works. So do you know what he's saying? <laughs> Get real here. Live your life like there's actually something at stake. Because there is. Verse 32. But be ever mindful of the days gone by in which after you were first spiritually enlightened, you endured a great and painful struggle. When people get saved there's, and they're enlightened, there's almost always a great and painful struggle to stay living for God. And he gives an example, verse 33. Sometimes being yourselves a gazing stock, publicly exposed to insults and abuse and distress. Well, there you go. Especially if you're first one out or you're the only one saved in a whole relation or a family that doesn't serve God at all. They're going to look at you like you're nuts. Gazing stock. And they will publicly at Thanksgiving, and I don't know why they're celebrating Christmas, but they always do. They don't serve God, but they celebrate Christmas. But at the Christmas meal, they're going to expose and insult you and abuse you. Sometimes claiming fellowship and making common cause with others who were so treated. So in other words, verse 32, there is some, some pain, endurance, you're going to go through to live for God because a bunch of the world don't want to do it. Verse 34, for you did not, for you did sympathize and suffer along with those who were imprisoned and you bore cheerfully in the plundering of your belongings, confiscation of your property, and in the knowledge of the consciousness that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. So you put up with stuff because you know how this ends. Verse 35, do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence. Well, now he's saying you're fearless. Yes, we are going to live this thing like we have no fear at all, but way in the back, whatever you do, pelts, don't screw this up, is always there. Pelts is my last name. It's how I talk to myself. So whatever your last name is, you can throw it in there. Yes, I'm fearfully trying to live, fearlessly trying to live for God. But there's always that thought of, dear God, don't let me screw this up. It's called the fear of the Lord. Do not throw away your fearless confidence, for it carries great and glorious compensation and reward. Man, you just keep after God, keep doing what he's telling you to do, and just go after it fearlessly, and the reward is going to be unbelievable. For you have need of steadfast patience and endurance so that you may perform and fully accomplish the will of the Father. You're going to have to hang in there some days. Steadfast patience and endurance. Not every day is going to be roses. You're going to have to hang in there to accomplish the will of the Father. And thus receive and carry away and enjoy to the, to the full what is promised. Verse 37, for still a little while, very little while, the coming one, that's Jesus, will come and he will not delay. But the just shall live by faith. My righteous servant shall live in his conviction, respecting man's relationship to the Father and divine things. Now that is, that, that is a whole little series right there. To live by our conviction, 
respecting my relationship to the Father and the divine things that come from him. And the holy fervor, that energy born of faith and conjoined with faith. That's a whole, that's a whole thing there of, man, to live by faith and respect this relationship and walk this thing out with a holy fervor. However, and if he draws back and shrinks in fear, you say, well, see there, the Bible's contradicting itself. First it says we're supposed to fear God. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then it says don't fear God. There's only one reason to fear God. It's going that way. Just keep living it. Just keep walking it. Just keep submitting. Just keep pushing in. Just keep growing. You have nothing to fear. But remind yourself, if we turn and mess it up and go that way, now we got something to fear. There's no contradiction here. But if we get afraid of what God's asking us to do, well, God's asking me to do this, and I don't know how I'm going to do this, and I'm, I'm afraid. I could, and, and, and I, I, that's what he says, don't shrink back. Don't shrink back. He's used that verse on me one time. I've shared it already, I think, maybe even in this series. It's when we were in the position to get this building, and we didn't have the money. We didn't have the money to make the monthly payments once we got the building, much less get the building. Now you're going to convince the banker we can do this. And I was out in a prayer walk. I was sharing with God. I said, we got a problem here. I know you want us to go after that building and do what needs to be done. But there are some things in the way. This is what he said to me. He said, if you shrink back, I'll have no pleasure in you. Only time he's ever said it to me. I told you what to do. Don't you dare shrink back out of fear now. We could lose it all. Don't you dare shrink back out of fear now. I don't take pleasure in that. My soul has no delight or pleasure in him. Verse 39. But our way is not of those who draw back. Exactly. To eternal misery or perdition. Especially we're not going to draw back that far. And are utterly destroyed. No, wait, wait, wait. I thought we were eternally secure. See, it pops up again. You can actually draw back and be utterly destroyed? Yeah, apparently. But we are of those who believe. What does that mean? To cleave to and trust in and rely on God through Jesus Christ the Messiah and by faith persevere or preserve the soul, I should say. So what's the whole point? The thing of living for God the Father for living for Jesus, following the Holy Spirit. This isn't a game. And this isn't to be taken lightly. We can lose our salvation. How we live does matter. And God will judge sin. Now, we won't have any because we're forgiven, right? We're clean. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Just stay there. His whole point is there's consequences over there. Just stay here. Because if you willfully, deliberately turn around and go that way, you're not going to like how this whole thing's going to end. The Father has determined how he's going to deal with Satan's sin and everything that follows. So let's hit a few scriptures here now on judgment and the Father, which we've been talking about it already, but let me just seal it up for you. Isaiah 66. Can you go there, please? We're in the Amplified. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? And what kind can be my resting place? For all these things my hand has made, and so all these things have come into being by me and for me, says the Lord. Now there the Lord does not necessarily infer Jesus. It's usually a Jehovah or Yahweh name there for Lord. But his point is this. He says, I built it all, I made it all, and now you're going to build a house for me to rest in. What can you make that I don't have already? Well, see, when we get to the New Testament, we find out. We're the temple. And he only gets that if we give it to him. 
middle of verse 2. But this is the man to whom I will look and have regard. He who is humble and of a broken and wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. Fear the Lord. This is the man to whom I will look and have regard. The one who has the fear of the Lord. He is humble. He's of a broken and wounded spirit. In other words, he's not this haughty, I'm all that person. And who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. And then he talks about hypocrites in verse 3. And then verse 4, he chooses what he's going to have for them. I choose their delusions, their mockings, calamities, afflictions. Here's what's coming for them. They think they're so hot, but they did not obey. They did not listen when I spoke. And that's the middle of the verse. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen. They did not obey. But they did what was evil in my sight and chose that. They chose it in which they knew I did not delight. So he's just describing the sinful mess and the whole thing. So now I want to go to the end of the chapter. This is the last four verses of the the last chapter of Isaiah. He's talking about the future now. So since we have this problem, and he wants to end sin, and he wants this thing done forever, how is he going to keep it from reoccurring in the future? Because it started with Lucifer. How do we know it won't start again at some point? Someone goes off and does their thing, and here we go again. Oh, he's got a solution for that. Verse number 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I, will, which I make, shall remain before me. So now we're talking new heavens, new earth time, says the Lord. So shall your offspring and your name remain. So in other words, there's good things. We can be with God forever. Verse 23. And it shall be that from one new moon to another... New moon from one Sabbath to another Sabbath. The Sabbath will be reinstated in the new heaven and new earth. It's not now under this time, but it will be. And there's new moons, so there's seasons being reinstated, new heaven and new earth. From one, you know, there's going to be times where this next thing he describes happens. At times, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. All flesh got to show up. And, and go ahead, you can go to the next verse. And they shall go forth and gaze upon the dead bodies of the rebellious men who have stepped over against me. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all mankind. You say, how is that going to work? I don't know, but there's going to be worship festivals where during the worship festival of the Father we get to see into the lake of fire and what happens when you go the other direction for all eternity. So if anybody gets a crazy thought like, I think I want to do it my way, every new moon and Sabbath, you're going to be reminded why that's not a good idea. Because the Father's not going to deal with this again. He's going to end it, and it'll be over. So the Father and Judgment, your book, there's so much in here that we could look at. I mean, it's just full, but I'm going to pick page 12. We're going to just look at a few verses, so I just want to point out to you where they're at. They're on page 12, letter J, the wrath, judgment of the Father. I'm just going to pick a number of these, and we're just going to read them. Let you see what that says right in there. John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of the Father Father abides on him. Remember, God in the New Testament is always the Father. It's Theos. So you can either choose life or you can choose the wrath of the Father. Now, he's not just angry. Wrath is when you lose it kind of angry. It's intense. Romans chapter 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Well, can you back up into chapter 1? I know I'm going slow here, but this so applies to today. Chapter 1, oh, 
let's go to, it's an ongoing thing. Jump into verse 28. Bring that up if you would, and I believe I'm in the, might be in the Amplified. Give me a second, I can tell you. I'm in the New King James Version. Reads quicker. Verse 28. So he's talking about this reprobate civilization that turned away from him. It started with not being thankful to God, and then it just went down from there. And it kept disintegrating and disintegrating, and uh, homosexuality, lesbian got involved, verse 26 and 27, just the kind of stuff we're looking at today. And then verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. So it's not like God wanted them to do this, but hey, you want it, so you're after it, so I'm going to let you do it. God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliceness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, in other words, uh, gossipers, backbiters, haters of God, vile, proud, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, inventors of evil things. Now, if that doesn't apply to today, he says, I can't even describe what they're doing. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, Verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only they do them, but they approve of people who do them. Boy, if that doesn't describe today. So now go back to Romans chapter 2. So, but we know that the judgment of God, so this is just, he just ended chapter one, jumps right into chapter two and starts explaining. But we know the judgment of God is according to truth against them who practice such things. What things? The things of chapter one. So God's going to judge them? Yes, he's going to judge them. Why? Because their heart turned away from him. Not only do they know they're wrong and continue to do it, but they encourage others to do it like it's a good thing. He says they're going to be judged. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Well, I'm a Christian. Whatever, fill it in. I'm a Christian liar. I'm a Christian adulterer. I'm a Christian gay. Do you think you're going to escape? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, the forbearance, the long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God is trying to get you away from that and lead you to repentance, to have repentance? you got to have a change of heart. And if you don't, there's going to be judgment from God. Ephesians 5, 1 through 7, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. As Christ has loved us, verse 3, But fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named among you. It's not fitting for saints, for Christians to be doing this stuff. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. But again, it's just not fitting for a Christian. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, covetous person, idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these kinds of things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The wrath of the Father is going to come against. You say, well, why did he make a list like that if it's a heart problem? Why do you look at the thermometer to see what the temperature is? The thermometer just tells you what's going on outside. The actions just tell you what's going on inside. The problem is inside. You clean up the inside, the actions change. The problem's the heart. Well, I have a good heart. Not by your actions, you don't. Don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm just reading what the Bible says, and it looks to me like you're going to come under God's wrath. Oh, don't say that to people. You'll offend them. Oh, let's just be quiet then. Let them go to hell. That's love. There is judgment from the Father. 
And it's our job to talk about it or it wouldn't be in the book. But he's so loving. I know he is. But he's also so holy and righteous and just. And he hates what sin has done and he's going to end it. Verse 7, therefore, since wrath's coming on that, make the right choice and don't be partakers with them. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, therefore put to death your members which are on earth, uh, which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, and he lists a bunch of stuff. Verse 6, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. The issue is the disobedience of the heart. The fruit is fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil passions, evil desires, etc. One more scripture, Revelation 14, 9 through 13. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast or his image and receives the mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of the Father. Well, I thought God didn't judge anyone. Apparently you thought wrong. She's going to come down. She's going to come down hard. Which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So it's like he's got a cup there and he's just putting his wrath in there. Into his indignation. This is like a bomb. That person shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. So we got the Father, we got Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep, his, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice the heart thing again. It's not works. You're not saved. By, for by grace you're saved, not of works. It's a gift of God. Here is the patience of the saints, those who keep the commands of God and the faith of Jesus. So if I do everything right, I'll be okay. No, if you keep your heart right, you'll be okay. You say, what does that mean? Just pursue God. Pursue God. Keep after God. Keep doing what God asks you to do. Keep not doing what God tells you not to do. Just keep after God. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. So you got the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit talking here. Uh, they rest from their labors and so forth. Folks, page 10 in your booklet. Let's wind this up. Page 10 in your booklet. Letter F. The Father is the God of, or the God who has tender mercy, grace, salvation. He is kind. He is good. He leads us to salvation. He has forbearance. In other words, he doesn't just come down with the club as soon as he sees something. He just pushes it off and pushes it off and pushes it off as long as he can, working with us. He's full of glory. He is the father of law and order. Minneapolis. <laughs> He's the father who has heirs. He has sons. He's full of mercy. He's full of compassion. He has sternness and kindness toward men, showing both sides of the coin. He's full of hope. He's full of peace. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, he's the one who comforts us. 1 Timothy 1, he's the God of power, love, sound mind, self-discipline. He doesn't want us walking in fear and timidity and cowering. This is our Father, and it's the one the church and Christians talk about. And boy, it's so true. But there's another side to the Father that we should be talking about. Well, I don't like those fire and brimstone messages. You'll like it a whole lot better in a message than sitting in it. Well, I don't like to listen to it. Well, guess what? You're not going to like what it feels like when you're sitting in it either. Here, we still have a chance to fix it. The same God who is offering us everything 
He is, has, and ever will be through our covenant with Jesus, pulled us into his family. We are heirs of everything he is and has. The universe belongs to us. Oh, God created it. But I'm his kid. I'm his heir. Heirs have right to the property of the parent. That's covenant. That father who is so awesome and just doing everything he can to welcome everybody in is the same father who is going to end this charade of sin and Satan and sickness and disease and this whole thing. He's going to end it. And it's which side we're on when it ends. Because one side's blessed and the other side's going to be judged. So I was standing back there at the end of prayer, because I always pray this coming into a service. God, is there anything, you know, I start earlier than there, but I was asking one more time before I go out and start greeting people and this, that, and the other. I said, is there anything you need to let me know as far as ministering to people, anybody here sick, diseased, and any of that that needs to be touched this morning? Is there anything you want to say to me before I slip off here? And Jesus spoke to me. It wasn't the Holy Spirit, it was Jesus. And he said this, this is not that kind of service. This is the kind of service where the Father's going to get the respect he deserves. So I unloaded my load, knowing that's what was wanted. Matthew 24, Jesus said, as we move into the end times, be careful you're not deceived. There's doctrines going around saying everybody's saved, they just don't know it yet. There's doctrines saying God the Father will never, he's a loving Father, he would never let anybody go to hell, much less see him sent there. And all this trash... The fear of, oh, God, I can't mess this up. My decisions here for a few short years on this earth could literally destroy my eternity. God, don't let me screw this up. The fear of the Lord, oh, we don't talk about that because that scares people. It should scare us. That's why it's called the fear of the Lord. The deeper we get into the end times, the thicker deception gets. And right now, it's really thick. And it's going to get thicker. Be careful you're not deceived into thinking, I can do whatever I want, live however I want, and I'll be fine. You will be the, one of the partakers of the wrath of God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow you're going to reap. There's only way on, on one way out of that harvest. It's forgiveness. That will get you out of that harvest certain times. Don't have time to go into the... <laughs> there are times you can repent and you're still going to serve your due. God, I'm sorry. I was going 95 miles an hour through Cambridge. I got a ticket and I'm in jail. If you forgive me, can you let me off? God will let you off, but they ain't going to. You're still going to pay. We are moving into the, the very, we're in a very deceptive time, and it's going to just get worse. The thing is, the American Christian has embraced the theology that has left out the judgment, wrath, indignation of God. When's the last time you turned on a podcast, the TV, anything, and heard them give you a message about the wrath, indignation, judgment, the fury of God that will be poured out on those who are not his? When's the last time you heard it? You haven't heard it, have you? Because we're already deceived. We're already convinced. That may not be true. No, it is true. 
And that is the point of this whole message. Don't be deceived. We have to determine not to be deceived. Because if we just go with the flow, we're going to be deceived. Because the flow of what's going on around us, the fruit of it is deception. I mean, you talk about weird society. I had someone text me the other day and they said, are you seeing what's going on like I'm seeing it? <laughs> That's all they said. And it's like, well, I don't know what you're looking at, but I'm guessing you're talking about society. It's gotten so weird. And it continues to grow. Yeah, I'm seeing it. And the church is good with it. Why are we not crying the heart of God? So, Lord, don't let us be deceived. Father, we don't want to go there. I pray this for me, but I think I'm praying for all of us. Don't let us mess this one up. Don't let us mess this up. There is nothing, nothing on this earth that is worth missing heaven over. There is nothing. And help us to stay clear-minded, to stay focused, to walk this out the way you've provided for us to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen.